Some of you might remember from back in the day when there was a slogan from sharp minds come sharp products. We're going to look at one or two or maybe three of these today. We have the EL5500 down there in the lower right. That's the main pocket computer. EL5502. It's connected with the associated printer from Sharp, which is connected to a Tandy TRS-80 cassette recorder from the same era. And we have some associated booklets to look at too. So we'll be looking at these today and see what we can get out of them. Here's the main unit, the EL5502 with text. Why they call it the 5502, I'm not sure in relation to the fact that these were sold as PC pocket computers other places in the world. And I think this was the PC 1401. It might have had something to do with keeping confusion away from some that they made for Radio Shack at the time when there was a series of the sharp pocket computers they made for Radio Shack with PC numbers, I think. But I don't think this was one of them. I think this stood on its own. So as you can see, we have, it uses BASIC to program, scientific calculator, 40 kilobytes of ROM in the BASIC, 4.2 kilobytes of RAM, 59 scientific and statistics functions, instant basic command keys for simple program, those are down here, 16 character dot matrix display, and there are better ones, I think the, I think the EL5503 has 24, 26 data memories and basic, optional printer cassette interface, uh, which we do have, and this also came with a book, Computing the Sciences, which you might take a little bit of a look at. It's pretty dry. And I'm not going to do a basic programming tutorial here because I don't know it. Uh, any basic I used, I forgot decades ago. Made in Japan, as you might expect. Opening it up, we have a quick reference guide, which is really just uh, commands. So those are your printer commands, syntax, error codes, and an ASCII chart. Much beyond the scope of this video. Then we have our main instruction manual. We'll look at a bit, bit of this but it's pretty dry too, so not much. And here's the main toy. It's in a uh, little slider case that comes off. And the slider case has a some error guides in it. There's the unit. Mine is not in good shape. It's very old, as you can imagine. 1984 these came out. Mine's actually missing the two screws on the back. There's some of the pertinence. But because those are missing, we can pretty easily open that and see where you put in two 2032 batteries. And uh, you can see the chip designation there. Over here we have a contrast control and on the back we also have our reset button which I use a lot when I get unexpected results and I think there's still something in memory. So I use that a lot. Um, turning it on we can maybe see how much memory is in it. Going to basic, right now we're in the cal calculator mode, but going to basic, going to programming mode, M, E, M, and 
enter. 35, 29 uh, bytes available. You can see a lot of the keys have um, extra functions above them. You get to those by pressing the shift key. You don't hold the shift key down, release it, and then you can depress the function. So most all of them have either two or even three functions available. And then you have certain designations where you're at with the cursor, calculator, and in basic you can run or program something. Then you'll have various things that will come up here. Uh, there's a memory signal and things. Memory safeguard, auto power off. I think it will hold your program in memory. I don't want it to hold my program in memory. I want it to get out. That's why I'm always pressing the reset. Uh, but there's some tricks to learning it, and they even supplied a template for people who use the programming keys a lot for various things. They can put their own wording on there as they develop button switches. And whoever had this one had something for a loan. So they did give you a nice template there to use. Looking at very briefly a little bit of the paperwork again, the quick reference guide. I showed this a few minutes ago. But you'll notice that's uh, 1984. And the system came with this Computing the Sciences book. Also copyright 1984. There's your chapters. This is a very, very, very scientific book as far as programming and trigonometry and calculating things. I mean, it's as dry as the Dickens. It's nothing we're going to be spending any time on at all. Uh, I don't even know if I use anything into it, but introduction to programming, things like that. One thing I did think was funny in here, on page uh, 133, there's a category called Games. Memory Taster? I suspect that's supposed to be Tester. So much for the quality control, right? Memory Taster. I'll be darned. And that's it for games. And then here's the actual instruction manual that came with it. Once again, very, very dry. Also, it skips a lot of the commands. I think it assumes you know them. And it's not going to repeat them for you in this book. It even says that somewhere, that this is not a tutorial. Lots of basic, lots of uh, boring things, at least for me they're boring. But we'll try and do something in basic and see what we can maybe print out on our little printer there. And maybe load something into the cassette player if we can get that to work. And Maybe reload it back into the system even. I don't know if that'll work or not. I have not tried it. So extremely dry. Not made for video, that's for sure. But that's what you should get if you get one of these complete systems. You should get the instruction booklet here. Maybe one of these. And maybe a quick reference guide. It's starting to look a little bit of the uh, performance of it, turning it on. It starts in cal calculator mode and operates just like a normal calculator. We won't spend too much time on that. 
I was sort of interested mostly in this video of showing the relationship between this unit, the optional printer, and maybe a cassette recorder. But, I mean, it's totally familiar to anybody who's ever used a calculator, and I think that's everybody. Um, square roots here. Sixty-five squared, the square root. So you might expect um, hundred and well, whatever eleven thousand one hundred fourteen raised to the sixth power. And that's your exponent values, which are in parts of four. So. Very familiar to anyone who's used a calculator. And you can bring up pi, which is a secondary variable above the exponent button. Shift. Now you notice the shift word has come there on the top. So we're going to be looking at a top function. And there's pi. Of course, there's a whole series of buttons for trigonometry and another whole section of buttons for statistics, which the book goes into great detail about if you need those. But the one thing I thought was very interesting is you can't use the optional printer to print out your results. It's not like an adding machine. You can use the printer when you're in basic to print out similar results, but it will not print in the calculator mode. I find that a little odd and unhelpful. Speaking of the printer, let's stop for a minute and take a look at that since that's what I wanted to get to here in a minute with basic. Here's the box that the uh, unit comes in. The CE-126P printer and cassette interface. Not much special about that. And inside the box, these are the contents. Comes with an extra roll of paper. It has a uh, wire patch cables for your cassette recorder and here's the main printer in a small case has an on off button remote if you want it to come on when you're using your uh, basic program I guess and a paper feed and it has output jacks here for your patch cable to go to your cassette recorder. Spot for an optional power adapter. But it runs on, as I have it, four AA batteries. Put it in down here. See how that works. And it comes with the instructions, of course. Nothing fancy. I always like the little uh, diagrams of what to do and what not to do. Notice the steering wheel in that car is on the uh, Japanese side, I call it. Some of the features. But there's many parts about this little instruction manual that are kind of odd. 
it doesn't. Depends on how you replace the paper. There. Shows the final setup there. There's the specifications, what you'd need to use this with, whatever tape recorder. I'll be using it with a Tandy TRS 80 tape recorder from 1983, which I've used with my Tandy 102 in a previous video. has a 11 pin connector to connect into the 11 pin port of the EL5500 and it reminds you to put the cap back on when it's not in use. All right, let's see. Turn the unit on, go to basic run. We want to get that print, no print, highlighted. So, shift, print. Now the print symbol down here is highlighted. We've got our remote on here. So, 500 divided by 10. Enter and fifty. So you have to remember to do this in run and change the print no print with the shift key. If you don't want your calculations printing out, you would leave that print off. Oh, I'm trying to run something out here. We're in basic and run. R U N. Got my printer set to print out, and that little indicator freezes up and goes away. And I have to completely reset the machine to get it to come back. And I really have to make sure I reset it too, not just poke it a little bit, really mess it up. So I don't know if something's going to print out or not. There's a command print equals L print, which should send it to this. I can use basic. I also print. I also use cassettes. I'm sharp. From sharp minds come sharp products. All right. It's just picky about syntax and things. Um, and I have to make sure I add a line at the start of the program that's not on here that says print equals L print, which shoot things out to here. So now I guess I'll see if we have any luck and can do anything with loading a program into a cassette and getting a program back off a cassette. All right, I'm going to try and do a cassette thing. Don't know if it'll work. I'm going to be using this 1983 Radio Shack TRS-80 computer, the CCR81. And I'm going to be using a 20-minute leaderless tape. Well, I don't know what we'll be able to do here. There's nothing I can do to get that little print Nope, there, look, it showed up. Maybe we'll get lucky. All right, I've got the cables in the cassette recorder and then the 126P. We're on here. The remote's on. I'm following the instructions. 
I have to save the program. But I tell you, nowhere in anything I've looked at for all these books does it tell you how to name a program. So I don't know exactly how to do this. Uh, the examples show run and then put name of program. I don't know the name of the program. There's nothing in here that names it, as near as I can tell. My coding is very inexact. So I'm going to try it just with the name of the first line, which is 10. So this is a... Um, this is what? C S A V E. That's the set save. Shift colon file name. I don't know how to name the file, um, but I know it starts with 10. Close quotes. And enter. Oh, look, it's doing something. And the prompt came, and it's over. Who knows? Maybe it worked. All right, let's. Rewind it. Play that back. Oops. I need to unplug this, don't I? Oh. Still got the earphone plugged in. Let's uh, see if I can get it back now onto the computer. First, I'm going to erase that program, which is on here, which I loaded onto there. So we'll put new. That erases the memory. So there should be no program on there except what's here. Now we'll do C L O A D. That was line number was ten, which is maybe the program's name. Is that all I need to do? play on, hit enter, it's playing and I'm getting weird noises here, that is a lot of noise for a little program. Says busy. Instructions say if an error code is not displayed, 
but tape motion continues while the pocket computer displays the symbol busy. Transferring is improper. Press OK on break to stop it. OK. I guess we could try it again. What are we, uh, C load? prompt came back. So that time it worked, maybe. Now, let's see what program is in here. Um, there's the various different lines. Can it print out? I've got the printer on. Well, something's printing out. What do we got here? Set test TRS-80 to sharp PC through CE-126P. Well, it does work a little bit. It's kind of a convoluted system. I'm not sure exactly why would you would have needed to want to do all this back in the early 80s, but it was fun to play with it for a vintage test, and it sort of does what it's supposed to do. Well, that's been the Sharp EL5500 II from 1984. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Bye.